This is Searchlight on Radio Adelaide, on Digital Radio Online and 101.5 FM. I'm Ewart Shaw. Research at the university is focusing its attention on one of the great mysteries of Adelaide's possibly criminal past. But before we get to the Somerton Man, let me introduce you to Professor Derek Abbott, who is part of the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, but heads a unit which is known as the Biomedical Engineering Unit. Derek, welcome to the program. What's the relationship between all these forms of engineering, electrical, electronic, and now biomedical? Well, electrical and electronic engineering is the name of our department. Um, electrical is basically anything with high voltages that uh, you can zap yourself with. Um, electronic just simply means low voltage electronics, you know, things you can run off a small battery, like computers and mobile phones and things like that. Um, biomedical engineering is... Uh, a centre we have in the university, it's not a department as such, but it brings together people from medicine, from uh, different forms of engineering and physiology uh, to g get together and apply their skills to solving various medical problems. For example, if you go into any hospital today, um, you will see it is replete with electronic instrumentation and scanners and, um, you know, MRI machines and all that sort of stuff, uh, en electronic engineers had to make that stuff. So uh, that's where electronic engineering comes into the biomedical world. Because, of course, so much of the activity inside our bodies does involve electrical currents and electrical impulses. So we're going from the big stuff that can zap you down to the small stuff you can use to the very, very tiny stuff essential to existence. Uh, that's right. So electronic engineers also have a role to play in understanding the body itself. Um, for example, in my group, we do what's called computational neuroscience, which is to study the, the way neurons work in software and try to make chips that mimic their behavior, partly because that's part of the pathway to understanding the fundamental science of it, but it also may have some interesting future applications where you can perhaps interface chips to the human brain in the future for prosthetic purposes. For example, artificial vision might be one in the future. And in fact, I've seen reports recently in the scientific literature online which suggest that bionic eyes are now possible, or at least small machines which mimic optical behaviour and can be virtually plugged straight in rather like a USB port behind the ear. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't have believed it myself if you'd said that ten years ago. And that's it. It's the, the massive, the rapid change as one form of scientific research nudges another one and says, hey, we can do this, or how do we do this? So that must be part of the joy of, of the unit you're part of. That's right, yes. And that... Joy in, in discovery, I suppose that's one of the things that motivates uh, all sorts of scientific endeavours. But you've actually been, and this was how I first became aware of you, you're examining a very public mystery, that of a dead body found on the beach at Somerton quite some years ago. What was the first inkling for you that Somerton Man might actually be a problem you could address? Oh, what was interesting about that case is it was not only a unidentified dead body, but that uh, associated with the body was a piece of paper with some apparently random letters written on it uh, that belonged to the body. And the police always wondered if this might provide a clue as to who he was or his identity or what he was doing. Uh, and it was always thought to be some sort of code, uh, but no one was able to crack it for over 60 years, and no one, still no one has. <laughs> but uh, as an engineer, um, you know, we deal, 
another thing we research on um, are things to do with computer security, cryptography, you know, how do you keep your passwords and PIN numbers secure or elect- when you do e-commerce and all that sort of stuff. So this is something um, electronic engineers are good at. And so I thought, well, let's apply some of our knowledge of probability and statistics and information theory uh, to this so-called code that no one's cracked. And I decided, uh, from an engineering point of view, what a fun thing would be to do is actually not to try to crack it, but to simply analyze it and say what it isn't. Uh, to say that it's not this type of World War II cipher or not this type of code or what have you. So we went through by a process of elimination and we eliminated over 20 types of uh, different codes that were known in that era, which is back in '48. And uh, we've subsequently then performed further statistical tests on it and we found that really... Uh, The closest thing it matches to is simply the first letters of words of the English language. So if you like, it's some kind of list of words or or some acronym. It could be something very banal like a shopping list (laughs) or a list of horses' names or or, or anything. Um, So uh, it probably isn't of much import to deciphering who this guy was. There is some possibility that we c- could find out what it says if there are actually if it's actually meant to be a sentence, because one of the things we're exploring now is how we can use the internet to actually uh, find strings of valid English words that follow those particular first letter patterns. Um, Unfortunately, Google doesn't let you do that. You can't go sort of A star, B star, T star or whatever. It doesn't allow wild cards. So we're we're looking at writing our own software to do that sort of thing. And back in 1948, as you said, it's just, it's just straight after the Second World War. There's a lot of suspicion about foreigners and Russian mm. agents and Nazis are on the run. Mm. Um and of course, stories are just coming out into the popular press, books, movies about the use of codes like codes and ciphers for secret agents. So back then in 1948, it must have been really something that engaged everybody's attention. Uh, yes, because the, as you say, the scene of the time was, um, you know, it's just after World War Two. And it was the era of spies, and uh, not not long after was the Petrov affair and um, Marilinga and all that sort of stuff. So to have a strange set of letters like that that look suspiciously like a code would have been a big bit of news for the time. But looking at it now in hindsight, it looks to us to be something more banal and not so exciting. Which is a shame for those of us who are conspiracy theorists. <laughs> yes. And and the hypothesis of the Summerton man being some kind of Russian spy is sort of waning away the more we research this mystery. It's looking more and more like the chap, chap was just a regular American who perhaps was visiting Australia. And um, there are a number of reasons why uh, the American hypothesis is looking interesting at the moment and that is um, the police at the time always said the aluminium comb in his pocket was American and that his jacket he was wearing was American because of the type of uh, machine stitching that was used uh, was not done for Australian jackets it was only done for American jackets at the time um, and there were those two American elements about this guy that were always there, but were never weighty enough on their own. And then just by chance, uh, more and more um, items have, 
are, are, sh- are showing themselves to look American uh, the, the deeper we look into it. For example, his striped tie that he was wearing when he was dead um, has stripes that slope into the opposite direction that Australian ties do. And I knew nothing about ties, but when I first noticed, the, the thought, hang on a minute, there's something funny about these stripes. I looked up the history of ties and stripes on ties, and it turns out the Brits um, were exporting the fabric to make ties to the Americans in the 1920s, and the Amer- Americans deliberately cut the fabric in the opposite direction to make the stripes slope the other way so that they couldn't be accused of saying we've taken the old Eton tie or whatever. Uh, so the tie would always look different from the English ones. And it's a it's a tradition that seems to have stuck today. I mean, if you look at any uh, contemporary photo of any American presidents, his tie stripes will always slope the opposite direction to ours. Um, it's not so true today now because people shop everywhere internationally and it's it's all a bit of a mix now. But back in the 40s, it was more regimented and it was more the case that the uh, stripes sloped in opposite directions. So that's one thing. Another interesting investigation I did um, a few years ago was to research the life of um, uh, Cleland, Professor Cleland, who was a professor here at the University of Adelaide back in the 40s. And he's significant because he's the guy that actually examined the Somerton man's body and actually found the slip of paper in the man's pocket that said the mysterious words Tumum should on them and connected the Somerton man to a lost poetry book that contained these code letters. He had some personal notes about the Somerton case. So this was an enormous breakthrough. And uh, as Cleland was examining the body, he wrote personal notes about what he observed and the items of the man's clothing and details about them. And there's some details there that aren't recorded in the original coroner's inquest. Uh, So I had new data. And there's something in there that I never thought anything of. Uh, I kind of passed it over. But Cleland had recorded that the Somerton man in his suitcase had what's called a shirt coat. I had no idea what that was. And um, I think a couple of years went by of me completely ignoring that little comment. But then when I got off my derriere and looked into it, lo and behold, uh, I, I thought, oh, I'll look up old newspaper articles in Australia to find out you know, who was wearing shirt coats and what fashion it, what type of fashion it was. And I found a 1948 article, Brisbane Courier, (laughs) uh, showing a guy coming, an Australian guy coming back from America, flying in from Honolulu to Brisbane, and showing him wearing a shirt coat. There was a photograph in the Courier, and the caption was... uh, He's come back from Honolulu wearing a shirt coat, but he's not game enough to set the trend here in Australia. (laughs) And so I thought, ah, that's very interesting. And then I looked up um, American newspapers of the time and lo and behold, found lots of advertisements for shirt coats. And in case your audience is wondering what a shirt (laughs) coat is, (laughs) is it simply a very long shirt with pockets at the bottom that you can wear hanging out? And um, uh, where it's sort of almost like a coat in hot weather. Or you could tuck it in and it would look like a normal shirt. So that's why it's called a shirt coat. And uh, I thought that was very interesting because the Somerton man otherwise looks very conservative in his dress tastes. And so if he was an Australian, uh, this would be a rather trendy thing for him to have for the time. So for somebody who's so conservatively dressed, you would have thought this would be uh, possibly an American influence. And there's the other little detail, like he had um, some chewing gum in his pocket, which again smacks of 
uh, something rather American. And when one looks in Australian newspapers of the era, uh, the adults of the time uh, uh, were very disparaging about chewing gum, and it would seem to be a sin of teenage Australian teenagers leaving uh, chewing gum on uh, dance floors and things like that, and were always being berated by the adults. So to to have a guy in his forty to early forties chewing gum. Is is possible in Australia at the time if you're a smoker, possibly, but was really、uh, more of a teenage thing, from the, the cultural impression I get from newspapers at the time. Unless, of course, you're American. So it's interesting that the the weight of evidence of of his items just seems to be getting more and more American. Then there's there's another strange fact.、Um, In the book where the code letters were was a phone number. The police rang that number, and that was a local lady who lived in Adelaide at the time. And then, when you trace who that lady was, it seemed that she was a single mother of the time, and had a son. And by coincidence,、uh, or perhaps not, the son has two missing teeth, front teeth. In fact, his canine teeth are right next to his middle teeth, and same for the Summerton man. So, joining the dots together, one wonders if there's the Summerton man is the father of this younger chap. So,、uh, and because that dental configuration is quite rare, it's a very compelling case that perhaps they are father and son. Unfortunately, the son. Has passed away and his body's cremated, so we don't have access to his DNA. But then there's his descendant and his wife that you can then subtract their DNA from together and put it on a genealogical DNA、uh, database. And one can run ones. Anyone can do this. You can put your DNA on a genealogical database where people all around the world voluntarily do that. And there's hundreds of thousands of people on there. And you, it's quite fun seeing who you match with. You may find some second cousin or third cousin or fourth cousin anywhere in the world. And because of uh, uh, the diaspora of、uh, different migrations、um, through the English-speaking worlds in the old days, it, it, the average person today in Australia will find、uh, cousins everywhere. And、uh, I tried this, and interestingly, there was a high density of American connections,、uh, particularly in Virginia, in America, which was rather interesting.、Um, that in itself, perhaps not so interesting, because many Australians today, if you put your DNA on a database like that, you will have American connections. You will have fourth cousins, fifth cousins out there. But what got me about this is there was such a High concentration in Virginia,、uh, more than anywhere else in America, and I thought, oh, perhaps this is something significant. And I started tracing the family trees of some of the people he was connecting with, and all these Virginians not only connected with this DNA, but connected on a specific location of chromosome eight. They all overlapped on that exact region of the chromosome. And every time somebody overlapped in that region, they turned out they'd always come from Virginia. And I thought, hmm, this is sort of rather significant.、And、then, when I was tracing their family trees, suddenly found that, in many cases, they connected to the tree of Thomas Jefferson, which is rather amazing.、Um, and from different directions, it wasn't always one link to Thomas Jefferson. It seemed that it was quite a A quite a broad thing, and so I was thinking. Well, this seems to be adding some more weight to the American hypothesis. And then we did what's called:、uh, you can run DNA through some software, which is called、um, Heritage Ad- Admixture Test software, and、uh, you can look at ethnic mixtures. And it seems that there was consistently a small amount of、um, American Indian DNA in that DNA. And so, how does somebody in Australia get a bit of American Indian DNA?、And、it's only if there was an ancestor that had to be there, that had perhaps a mother 
that was an established mother um, in America and then moved to Australia eventually. So um, that's it uh, for the American hypothesis. All I can say is it's looking very compelling. Um, there are still further tests to do, further further forms of verification we need to do to be 100% certain. But I believe uh, the evidence we have is compelling enough to make one want to look at, uh, say, ship's passenger logs from America to Australia in the 40s with, in, in more detail with greater scrutiny because the Somerton man might be one of those people. Now, we've, in a sense, cleared away a lot of the, the brushwood ar around the issue, and you've been able, by using very reputable scientific techniques to come up with all this information. What can you use that sort of research methodology for? I, I can imagine giving a problem like this to your students is a really good way of sharpening their ability hmm. to approach a problem from three or four different angles. Sure. That's right. And it's also exercising forms of critical thinking as well. So there's there's all sorts of things. And as you can see, it leads to practical consequences as well. Um, I'm a great believer in that um, all research, no matter how arcane, always leads to something practical. Like where, where our work is going with the code is to write software that can search for sequences of letters on the Internet because Google can't do that. It doesn't allow you to do wildcards. And so this might, in fact, uh, be a useful product that could have commercial value for, for, for people that want to search for all sorts of other things out there on the Internet. We've tailored it for the specific problem, but it could have broader consequences. And the techniques we're developing for uh, doing um, genealogical searches for people uh, using DNA ha has enormous consequences because uh, there are lots of cases of um, unidentified bodies that are found, um, murder victims from uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they've been un unidentified. And these c can now be possible techniques for shedding light on those cases. And there's also many, uh, many, many cases of adopted children who really want to know who their real parents are. And by putting their DNA on a, a genealogical database and finding out all their distant cousins, they can triangulate back from those family trees to find out who they really are. And so I think there's a, there's a great social uh, service there to the community in these sorts of techniques we're developing. As well as the administrative part of your work, there must be some particular project on your desk, which is um, Derek Abbott's intellectual focus. What is it? Okay, so uh, the Summerton case that I work on is one of many projects that I work on. Perhaps the largest project that I work on um, the one that, uh, in fact, uh, creates most of the funding for my research group is I work with lasers and um, using them for biological sensing purposes to sense uh, small amounts of different molecules, biomolecules and chemicals for, for medical purposes, for things like um, doing um, scanning DNA chips and... Um, uh, proteomic chips uh, for screening for diseases and that sort of thing. Um, so it's work as an engineer. How can we make the sensitivity of sensing small amounts of molecules using lasers? Um, so that's the main thing I do. And it ties in with, of course, the new science of photonics. Yes. And the concept of biophotonics. I used to joke that there were four professors at the university in their late 20s 
who were working in areas that didn't exist when they were undergraduates. Mm. And then I met a nanoscale biophotonics expert and thought, right. So it's something that is just, as well as focusing down and down and down onto one tiny piece of scientific activity, is opening out and out and out. That's right. Like so much of the rest of your work. In, and it's just filling in the gaps for uh, other scientists. It's pointing the way for other scientific research. It must be something really wonderful to be part of. Oh, yes, I, I love it. I find it extremely stimulating. Um, and I don't think I ever want to retire. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward over the next few years, Derek Abbott, to talking about everything and we can so much more to your work and life than a dead bloke on the beach. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. This is Searchlight on Radio Adelaide on Digital Radio Online and 101.5 FM. I'm Ewart Short. My guest has been Professor Derek Abbott of the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering here at the University of Adelaide, one of the lead researchers into the mystery of the Somerton Man. <laughs>